Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to give you a moment to settle into your Zoom box. We're so glad that you're here with us today and um, that you'll be joining us for this program on disinformation, midterms, and the mind. I'm Julie Moose. I'm the executive director of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, and I'm welcoming you on behalf of our partners in this program, Pan America and the American Psychological Association. We're grateful to be in such esteemed company. And I am joined behind the scenes at the Institute by Beth Francesco, who is the deputy executive director. And you will see her in the chat along with folks from Penn and from APA. We have live transcription, closed captioning option available during this program. So if you're joining on a desktop or a laptop computer, you can enable this at any time by finding the live transcription button in the navigation menu and just click show subtitle and the closed captioning should start. And you can also disable this at any point by clicking uh, hide subtitle. I'm gonna put this in the chat as well for everybody. And um, we are gonna be recording this program. And so, uh, so don't worry if you miss something or uh, wanna hear it again, um, we're going to email you the link uh, later today, so you'll have a, an opportunity to watch it a second time if you uh, if you'd like, or share it with anybody who um, uh, who you think it will benefit, or who might have planned to be here and missed it. Um, we also are going to put the highlights from the program and the video in our newsletter as well as on our website. If you aren't already receiving our newsletter, you can subscribe. Uh, the link is in the chat now. So uh, so that's all the preamble. Uh, we will get to the program now. And the program really is designed to be a conversation among our panelists, and we hope that you will join in as well. We're really interested in your questions and your comments. Please share questions anytime in the Q&A queue, and we'll uh, be monitoring them and respond to them later in the program. And please also share comments and thoughts in the chat. And now it is my honor excuse me, to introduce this program's moderator, Summer Lopez, who is Chief Program Officer Free Expression at PEN America, and who has spent extensive time learning and talking about the topics we're going to be discussing. We could not be in better hands. So Summer, over to you. Thank you so much, Julie. It's such a pleasure to be here today. And I want to thank the National Press Club Journalism Institute and the American Psychological Association for their partnership in bringing this important conversation to life. PEN America, for those who don't know us, is an organization that stands at the intersection of human rights and literature to defend the freedom of expression in the US and around the world. And we are 100 years old this year. And going back actually as far as 1948, the PEN Charter warns of the dangers of mendacious publication. I think a nice uh, literary way of saying disinformation. Um, and for the past five years, we at PEN America have been very engaged on this issue. Um, this is because we recognize disinformation as a threat to freedom of expression, to the very meaning of language, to a free press, and to democracy itself. And our work includes engaging with community leaders, local journalists, and other trusted figures, conducting media literacy workshops in which we always emphasize the importance of understanding the psychology of disinformation, part of why I'm so excited about today's conversation. And it includes research. And earlier this year, we published the findings of a research effort in which we surveyed over a thousand journalists and editors to better understand the impact that disinformation is having on them and their work. And I'll give a quick overview of those findings to set the stage for the conversation. But first, I want to introduce our remarkable panel. Welcome to you all and hello. It's an honor to get to spend an hour with you today. Um, and today we have with us Dolores Albaracin. Uh, she is the Alexandra Heyman Nash University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, also the Director of the Social Action Lab and of the Science of Science Communication Division at the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the Annenberg School for Communication. Um, and Dolores studies the impact of communication and persuasion at, on human behavior and the formation of beliefs, attitudes, and goals, particularly those that are socially beneficial. We also have Tiffany Xu, who reports for the New York Times as part of the technology team covering misinformation and disinformation. We have Jay Van Babel, Director of the Social Identity and Morality Lab and Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at New York University. And Jay's research examines how collective concerns, group identities, moral values, and political beliefs shape the mind, brain, and behavior. And 
Anya van Wagtendonk, a misinformation reporter at Grid News, where she focuses on the impact of false information on policy, elections, and social behavior. So before we turn to our panelists, I'd like to first share some key findings from PEN America's survey report, which is called Hard News, and we will share that link in the chat for folks as well. Um, as I said, we conducted this over the course of a year through um, focus groups and surveys of over a thousand journalists and reporters from across the U.S. And perhaps unsurprisingly, especially given how much interest we've seen in this event today, there was consensus among the surveyed journalists that disinformation is a serious problem for journalis journalism today and that it is significantly impacting their work and their experience as journalists. We received an absolute flood of very passionate responses in the open narrative section of the survey, very much uh, something that is on people's minds. And more than 90% of the respondents said that they had made changes in their journalistic practice as a result of disinformation, that it is creating new burdens and placing new demands on their time. Some 17% also said they had opted at some point not to do a story out of fear of having it, having it labeled fake news and having their work discredited. At the same time, most journalists said they didn't feel that they had the specialized skills or the newsroom support systems to respond to disinformation adequately. Only 30% of the journalists said their news outlet had generally effective processes in place to cope with disinformation. And when asked about eight different potential steps that media outlets could take to address disinformation, including training journalists in how to report on it, putting systems in place to respond to it quickly, one in three said their newsroom had not taken a single one of those steps. And of course, we recognize that's often because newsrooms just don't have the resources needed to do so. There was also real uncertainty regarding some of the fundamental questions of how best to respond, which is certainly going to be part of our conversation today. For example, answers were very mixed in response to questions about whether or not to debunk disinformation at risk of amplifying it. And to bring it back to the election, the group journalists identified as being most targeted by disinformation campaigns that they see was voters with high levels also for senior citizens and racial or ethnic minority groups, which of are of course also groups that face more hurdles to voting. And respondents also identified the greatest sources of disinformation as right-wing conspiracy theorists and elected officials, candidates, and political organizations, which obviously raises other questions about how journalists cover disinformation coming from candidates for office in the context of an election. So these findings suggest to us that what we're seeing is something of a perfect storm in which disinformation is placing new burdens and demands on journalists at the same time that other threats like online and offline harassment and intimidation are also increasing. And at the same time that many newsrooms and especially the local and community outlets that the public is most likely to trust are struggling just to survive financially. And all of this, of course, at the precise moment that the work of journalists is at its most essential to defend against the erosion of our democracy. So especially in the context of increasingly contentious elections, it means we're at a critical moment to support reporters, editors, and newsrooms to meet the challenges of practicing journalism in an information space polluted by so much disinformation. So PEN America is going to keep working on these issues. We're committed to working with journalists and newsrooms and to developing resources and guidance on how they can best respond to these new challenges. So I hope you will stay in touch with us if you'd like to learn more. You can visit us at pen.org, follow us on social media at PEN America. And on that report page, there's also an email address. We really wanna hear from journalists. So please feel free to reach out. But I would now like to very much turn to our panelists. Um, so Jay and Dolores, I'd like to start with you because I think understanding the psychology of how mis- and disinformation work is essential to countering it. And we really want to understand the research and the science here. Um, and Jay, if I can start with you, you study the role of identity and partisanship in the spread of mis- and dis disinformation. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so um, the way that we normally address misinformation historically has been through things like fact checks. We present people with the facts impartially and they update their beliefs. And it turns out there's lots of research on that and it tends to work really effectively for most topics. Um, however, it works much less effectively in the domains of like politics, morality, you know, issues where people's identity is threatened by the facts. And so um, what, what ends up happening, I think, in a case where we're at you know, the worst levels of polarization in 40 years in the US, you know, probably a lot longer before that, but we don't really have the data. Um, it's a situation where a lot of information that is going viral is spreading because it affirms people's identities. It's often good news about their side or uh, what we find in our analysis of social media is uh, one of the single most uh, powerful things you can do to go viral is share negative information about the other group that you're not that you're not politically identified with. 
And so um, what that means is that polarization essentially becomes a vector for the spread of misinformation. It's like a risk factor that's embedded in our society right now. Um, I will say, and this is based on like carefully controlled experiments that we've run in my lab, um, that Democrats and Republicans are both equally susceptible to believing misinformation when we kind of create it from scratch and make it very equivalent. Um, however, Republicans are far more likely to share it. And so what that means is that we have to think carefully about like what are the norms and the culture, the signals from leadership, the messages from from that uh, media ecosystem that are making it normative and incentivizing the spread of misinformation. Um, and, and although a very small number of people, uh, you know, generate most of the misinformation, um, it goes widely because it is congruent or aligns with their uh, partisan identities. And so those are just some of the issues that we've been tackling. We've been also trying to develop interventions and things like that that might work uh, to address this issue of partisanship and the spread of misinformation. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I might ask you to come back and talk a little bit more about those interventions too. But um, first, Dolores, I wanted to ask you, in our conversation before the, the event, you were telling me about the way that disinformation can be magnified, its impact can be magnified by a sense of anxiety. And of course, goodness knows we are all living in a period of compounding sources of anxiety. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, that's uh, specifically referring to the impact of conspiracy beliefs, which are um, very much influenced by, first of all, primary source, right-wing media, uh, cable news, and, and various outlets, websites, so nothing subscribed to social media, for instance. And second to that, because that is truly uh, where most of the impact what we are seeing comes from, is the level of anxiety in the population. So if I feel uncertain, fearful for reasons completely unrelated to the, the piece of news, I'm more likely to pay attention to that information and to actually um, believe in it because it, it's consistent with the feelings I have at this time. So if I feel anxious and uncertain and now I read and there's a conspiracy out there, well, all of a sudden this makes sense. So that uh, amplifies it. And the problem with this is that we have, you know, varying levels of anxiety for, you know, from coming from multiple sources. It could be um, our personality, but here we're actually studying things that vary daily and situationally. So it could be that we had a bad day or that we received a piece of uh, health news that made us worried. But in addition, this anxiety is also very much impacted by the same media that are in, injecting the stories of, of uh, conspiracies. So exposure to Fox News, Breitbart actually raises my level of anxiety. They also introduce a story and my anxiety acts as sort of the secret sauce to amplify the impact of that message. So that's where it's, coming from and it doesn't mean there is nothing we can do but it is something to be aware of that you know if if things uh make us anxious it, it makes us more prone to to believing in in those kinds of stories in addition of course anxiety plays a, a huge role in um the phenomenon of selective exposure something i i've studied uh with my team for decades because that is driven by anything that introduces a threat, which is the same type of phenomenon Jay is referring to, makes me seek the comforting congenial information as opposed to anything that would disconfirm my ideas. Can I ask what sort of lessons you feel journalists should take from that? What should they think about when they're doing their own reporting as a result of that information? Well, I think um, if we could have um, a media climate and we in which we can sell information without having to hype it, <laughs> that would reduce this potential impact. So maybe uh, other using other uh, sources of interest that are not just fear would go a long way at, at you know, reducing this potential. That, that would be one aspect. Then also sort of instructing and, and educating the audiences uh, about these potential biases could, could be important as well. Mm -hmm. And using forms of sort of allowing all of us to manage emotions in, in a way that's, you know, 
healthier without necessarily going into these uh, rabbit holes. Okay, thank you. Um, and Jay, we had a couple of follow-up questions about the differences between uh, Democrats and Republicans' behavior in terms of sharing disinformation and misinformation, and um, and also whether that's a new uh, phenomenon or whether that's been the case for a longer period. Could you say a little more about that too? Yeah, I mean, so these are great questions. I'll try to clarify. I, I wanna be accurate and, and as fair as I can be given the data that I've seen. And Dolores will, of course, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so my, so a lot, some people, some scientists think that there's just like fundamental personality differences between liberals and conservatives. And so maybe this is a deep rooted issue that we can't really fix. Um, but what the data that I've seen in my own lab and other labs suggests is that uh, liberals and conservatives are both similarly susceptible to misinformation. And if you look in other countries, you're often not seeing the same pattern you are in the US where it's like the right wing is spreading much more misinformation. Um, in many countries on many topics, there's really not polarization around like beliefs about vaccine conspiracies or um, climate change um, misinformation. And so that really seems to be situated in a, a small number of countries in the US in particular seems like an outlier. And so then you have to think of, well, what is it in the community of the Republican Party uh, that is amplifying the spread of misinformation? And so I think there's at least three things that stick out to me. Um, one is uh, language and lessons from leadership. And so you can look just, there's been tons of analyses on how much misinformation say Donald Trump shares. Um, and he was sharing it on Twitter before he was kicked off, but, um, but he now spreads a lot of it on Truth Social. Um, and at his recent rally, he, he was doing like QAnon signals. And so this is a way of signaling like an affirming um, conspiratorial communities and misinformation. Um, and then that's amplified by a group of people around him, other elites. And so elites and leaders are the key that people look to to determine a what to believe, but also whether it's worth spreading that information. And so if you're a loyal party member or to trust your leader, you're more likely to amplify and spread that misinformation. Um, and then the second thing that that feeds into is norms, that you're much more likely to share something that you're not sure about if you think it's okay either to get it wrong or if you think it signals that you're a good party member in your community. And so like, for example, the stop the steal conspiracy, it's easy to put like a flag about that in your front yard if you think that that's gonna be well received by your neighbors. Um, if you're in a community that where that's gonna not well be well received, then you're less likely to do it. And I'll say this as a scientist, if I were to spread a lot of misinformation on my social media, I would suddenly stop getting invited to, to events like this or to academic conferences or people wouldn't wanna work in my research lab anymore. And so I would get discredited um, if I spread a lot of misinformation. Um, and so the norms of the community matter a lot. And then the third thing I think is the media ecosystem is that there are certain ecosystems of media that are constantly hammering home themes that align with certain uh, conspiracies and misinformation. And so it makes it easier to believe uh, even by a fairly rational person, if you're hearing this over and over again, it seems more true. And so those are at least like three things that seem like really particular to the American political uh, media ecosystem that we're dealing with. And I think you've raised um, one of the questions that I did want to come back to, which is, you know, I think journalists struggle with this question of how do you debunk mis and disinformation without simply amplifying it, particularly given the fact that people do tend to believe things, you know, the more that they hear them. So I'm curious if you could say a little bit, and Dolores, I'd like to hear from you as well, actually, about, you know, how you think uh, debunking can be done most effectively if you think it is the right way to go. Uh, Dolores, do you want to go? Yes, uh, the first question is, uh, you know, a critical one. When to debunk? Because if we debunk everything, even the information that almost nobody believes in, we amplify it, like your report uh, very clearly states and people are aware. So my own um, criterion, which uh, we, we published in, in, you know, articles, also in the book, which I, I place in the chat, is that anything that's... Uh, believed by more than 10% of the population is a highly salient belief. This is a criterion that has been in place, you know, or that can be ex extrapolated and, and taken into this domain. So I, I would try to debunk anything that's above 10% of the population. So once it's there, it's, uh, yes, better to definitely make sure we correct it. And, and the best forms of correction are, are very well stated in the debunking manual that was led by 
Lewandowski in the UK. I participated in it and you first uh, introduce whatever is accurate information rather than you don't lead with the misinformation because people might stop reading and, and then they read the wrong thing. So we start with what's right. Then you address in the myth and, and move forward to actually correcting it. And you need to correct it in a very detailed way to, to make sure you kind of track all the pieces of what's a mental map. So people who, you know, believe misinformation and are exposed to it for the first time, create a fairly complete mental map. And if you don't manage to, to really tap it fully, then it's not going to be corrected. So you need to make sure that you introduce all the causal explanations as to why something that was said might have had some plausibility, but it really was this other way. And, and that is what allows you to, to debunk more fully. The best way though, according to a meta-analysis that we published a number of years ago, and now we have another one, and I'm gonna put it in the chat uh, next, is to make your audience an active debunker. That, this is actually the main factor that we find in this meta-analysis of all the experimental evidence on debunking. How do you get the audience to be critical? And, and this is, I think, where the media play a really critical role in, in you know, sharing the mindset with which, which you approach a story, sharing how, how you went about it, sharing your own doubts and being critical of the story rather than, you know, introducing perfectly, uh, you know, well-rounded things that don't quite uh, reflect, uh, you know, the, the critical process that went into it. So the, these are some of the factors. In addition, I, I would very much emphasize that trying to convey more of the truthful information that has, I mean, that's of course your goal, but this is to some extent more important than, than debunking. So filling up pages, filling up pages with what is uh, truth and emphasizing the level of uh, accurate information and not only the, the problem of misinformation, because when we hype the fear of misinformation, then that's interpreted as well. If it's all fake news, why should we read anything? So we need to be countering this potential bias too. Absolutely. Thank you. I think it's really interesting too, because I think you raise an important point about sort of being honest with the audience about the, the challenges that go into reporting, the questions that reporters might even wrestle with. You know, somebody asked in the in the chat about, you know, sharing your own story of how you might have dealt with disinformation and being targeted or being susceptible. I think that can actually be quite powerful, but it, it might seem counterintuitive to sort of open up uh, some of that honesty, but I think it actually does help with sort of some of the trust issues as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Honesty and transparency, I think, must come first. Um, Jay, one more question for you, and then we will move to Tiffany and Anya. Um, and this comes from some of the uh, comments. This is an easy one. Uh, what actually works to change people's minds? Does debunking actually make progress on that? Yeah, so first of all, I, I just want to let everybody know I shared the debunking handbook, which is available, like, I think, 20 different languages in the in the chat that Dolores mentioned, um, which kind of summarizes a lot of the kind of current thinking on this, but I'll summarize at least three things that come to my mind um, to, to expand on what Dolores said. Um, one is, and, and I've seen the research on this is very effective, it's called pre-bunking. And so basically, if you can anticipate what the lies are going to be or the misinformation or conspiracies are going to spread is get the facts out before those really go viral. Um, and so what that does is it acts like a vaccine. You're immunizing people to the misinformation that they're going to receive. And so they understand that what they're going to see, they have a chance to understand why it's false. And so when they do encounter it in the wild, they're ready to discredit it and see it more skeptically. And so that's something I would think of if you're a journalist is like, what are going to be the big themes of misinformation, say, in the midterm election? And then let's get the accurate information out and pre-bunk what those are before they really kind of take off or start coming out. Um, another thing that we found in, in our research of a paper on this uh, coming out soon is, again, this will go to partisanship. We had people fact from different parties. You'd see someone from the left or right fact checks sharing uh, misinformation. Then what happens if they got fact checked? And we found that 
Um, fact checking works in those types of political discussions, but it's very, very weak. In fact, we found something that was 10 times as powerful for shaping people's beliefs. And that was simply whether you identified you were same part of the same party as the person sharing the misinformation or, or the fact check. So basically what it means is people believe misinformation that comes from people in their party, or they believe fact checks that come from people in their party. And so we, we haven't done this study yet, but this is where we're going with it is like, if you're going to build, if you're going to do a fact check piece is try to get voices from different parties that debunk it. I, ideally, the key parties that are likely to be spreading it because those are gonna be more trustworthy uh, to those types of audiences that otherwise might dismiss the fact check completely. And so think about the role of identity in, in your fact checks and bake that in. Um, and then the third thing is, and this is uh, a paper we have under review right now, we have a bunch of studies on this, is we need to think about new incentives. Um, and so we found that if you give people some accuracy incentives, some money for getting it right, um, people are much more likely to spread true information. And not only that, but it, it almost completely gets rid of this gap between Republicans and Democrats. Um, and so Republicans are very responsive to these accuracy incentives. Uh, I think it's because they have, some of them have the wrong incentives for spreading misinformation. If they're incentivized to be accurate, they can do that. Um, we also have looked at ways to like, you could potentially change platforms. So imagine if Twitter had a misleading button instead of just a like button or retweet button. Um, we find that the moment you add that, if people can see that a lot of others have like 200 people have said this is misleading they're much less likely to share it um and it's especially true if they think those misleading uh counts are coming from people like them and so social norms are really powerful and we look to people like us people in our party people with our belief system to determine what we can or cannot trust and so there are ways that we can think of incentivizing accuracy or baking it into the platform so imagine if you have a comment section on your your journal website instead of just having people like or dislike something they're and they're just incentivized to get clicks or likes um change it to is you know counts for is this accurate or is this useful information and that's the type of incentive structure that seems like uh, there's preliminary evidence on that too that that seems to work it will help surface accurate information and kind of downrate uh inaccurate information so those are just a few ways that's so interesting and i think uh, you know pen america as a, as a free expression organization we're always trying to think about ways that you know, the platforms can make adjustments that don't necessarily silence anybody's voices, but that help us, you know, address what's being amplified and what's being more broadly spread. That's a really, really interesting one to think about. Um, Anya and Tiffany, you both write about and report on disinformation. And obviously, as we discussed, journalists are struggling with sort of how to do that, how to avoid magnifying it, how to be responsible, um, but also, you know, transparent in their reporting. Um, Tiffany, can you start by just telling us a little bit about how you're approaching this issue and particularly in the context of covering elections? Yeah, sure. So the Times put together a dedicated team to cover misinformation, disinformation. And it's been helpful because we in this group have a lot of conversations about this topic. It helps with gut checks and sharing resources. So I personally regularly monitor a suite of platforms and outlets and researcher accounts. Um, when I see a false or misleading narrative emerging, I try to gauge a few factors like what is the momentum? Um, how much is it being shared and where? What's the scope of the potential damage? Uh, there's a lot of mis and disinformation bubbling up on various sources that would really thrive on the oxygen of extra coverage. So we're careful about what we cover. Uh, instead, we tend to look at topics um, that have broad interests and effects, uh, voting, major events, public figures, uh, for example, we wrote about conspiracy theories that began trending within hours of the Uvalde shooting um, because major politicians were repeating them. Um, Trump might not have as many followers on Truth Social that he used to on Twitter, but his engagement with QAnon accounts on that platform, that fringier platform, are interesting because A, of who he is, um, B, the fact that tens of millions of Americans believe at least some QAnon tenants, and C, because the platform, um, because of the platform jumping ability of many of his posts, which tend to reemerge outside of Truth Social, um, and just like with any other story, uh, we're careful, really, really careful about research and attribution. Um, I talked to a lot of researchers and experts who have covered disinformation long before it became a buzzword. Um, a general uh, rule of mine is to not base my reporting off of content that I haven't seen firsthand in its original format. Um, and we're, we're very explicit about what narratives are baseless or misleading or outright false. We're, we're very clear about that in all of our stories. 
Thank you. Um, and Anya, I think one of the issues that has come up also in PEN America's work is that the very word disinformation has become fraught and politicized for a lot of people, which can make it hard to even have conversation. How do you think about that and how do you approach that in relation to your reporting? Yeah, I think sort of a, um, a catch-22 that a lot of journalists in this work find is that um, it is a very sort of smart tactic that leaders have taken, you know, over history to um, erode trust and faith in journalists and in sort of like the expert class. Um, and so we end up in this a little bit of a chasing our own tail situation of trying to be, you know, an institution that folks can turn to, to find the best information, to find either the fact checks or sort of the, um, the meta analysis of what this piece of disinformation is. And yet we also know that there is some amount of identity formation that takes place, you know, at the level of being a person who does not trust the media, being a person who does their own research. Um, and so to the extent that we are trying to reach an audience um, based on the idea that we are an institution that provides facts and truth and analysis, um, there is also going to be some portion of an audience that is going to hear that and kind of expressly react um, in a negative way to whatever we may present. And so I think, you know, being able to have these more kind of meta conversations about not merely the information, the facts um, itself, and whether it is true or not, but sort of like what it means to be engaging with these narratives and, and who are the movers and shakers kind of behind spreading misinformation campaigns. I think that is like one area where um, it's, it's interesting, right, that we are not merely reporters who are doing good reporting work in whatever the subject is, but specifically writing about disinformation um, and applying that lens, because I think or I hope that it can kind of bring our readers and our audience along with um, the work of journalism, which is to apply that kind of skeptical, um, critical lens, but without it being about kind of um, blowing up every understanding of what is true or what we can trust. Thank you. Um, and I think somewhat related to this, I mean, there is also, I think, this broader question of sort of whether there is a segment of the audience that is essentially kind of lost to mainstream media. Um, but I also think that, you know, what we hear a lot in reality is that most people are really just kind of confused and overwhelmed by information sources and they're looking for credible sources of information they feel they can trust. And especially maybe true in communities that have faced historic marginalization where that distrust comes from very real experiences. Um, it may also be true in places that just have, you know, maybe in a, a sort of news desert and essentially lack local um, sources of credible information. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, if you could each say a little bit about how you think journalists can build trust with people who are skeptical um, and how they can reach audiences that, you know, may not be coming to you uh, kind of naturally of their own accord. Um, Tiffany, could you go first? Yeah, so I I try not to think of myself as writing for a specific audience, um, more that I hope that my stories are accessible to anyone who wants to read them. Uh, I get feedback from a lot of people. Sometimes it's pretty surprising. You know, doubters will say, hey, that made me think about this. Um, and, and sure, there are lots of people who probably have no interest whatsoever in the Times, but I'd like to provide solid supported reporting for them if they ever change their minds. Um, on this idea though of, of people maybe not being completely behind a shut door, but more just confused about kind of the morass of information and misinformation that's out there, there's there's an interesting statistic from a research group called um, Equis uh, about Spanish language disinformation. What they found was that there's um, a pretty large core group of people that could be open to interventions. I mean, these are people who are generally younger, they're generally female, they're less likely to be college educated, they get their information from more mainstream sources like Twitter and Facebook as opposed to fringier platforms. And these are all people who, given the chance, would would be open to learning more, to, to education about, you know, being able to parse through um, different sources of information. So I think to, to say that there are people who are completely shut off from being saved, so to speak, um, is maybe not the right way to to look at the um, the issue. Thank you. Anya, thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, I think, have my optimistic answer, um, and I don't have a, a solution to how to sort of actually make this happen, but I absolutely think um, the degradation of local media has a significant amount to do with this. Um, there is a lot of research that shows that we trust information when it comes from a friend or a family member or a peer. Um, and there was a time, right, when a, when local journalists were part of your community. Uh, my background is in local. I worked for um, one newspaper in particular that once had 150 reporters in the newsroom. By the time I got there, I was one of three. Um, same coverage area, same coverage mandate. But, you know, I would go to events um, and people would be shocked to see a journalist, you know, covering the event because it just became so unusual. Um, and so if you don't kind of see the journalists who are covering your community as a member of your community, if you don't see journalists kind of period as representing what it is like to just be a working voting human being in America, um, I think that you are not going to have that same level of trust. Um, and so again, I don't know how to kind of put that genie back in the bottle. Um, obviously, I would like to say invest in local news. Um, it is much more complicated than that. Um, but I really think that that has had a ripple effect also for those of us in national media and again in sort of um, in the expert class, um, if you want to call it that, um, that people just don't have that same kind of relationship with news and media and it ripples out. Great. Jay or Dolores, I wanted to see if either of you wanted to chime in on any of that. Well, one aspect, and, and I mean, my turn to chat a bit, but of course, it's uh, like somebody's pointing out, it's not possible to pre-bunk and debunk every single piece of fake news that's out there. It's just too much. It's not worth it. So what, what the approach needs to be is, is really thinking about the broader processes. How, how do we connect with educators? How do we involve schools? How, how are kids actually taught that, you know, this is what the media are doing and, and you know, and creating more knowledge and connections in the community broadly and making the community more critical. That's going to, to pay off a lot more than trying to debunk each piece. The other thing is that debunking, pre-banking all these, you know, content specific issues need to be sought out in, in really uh, relation to how actionable the information is. And, and not all of it is actionable. If something says, click here to vote on Facebook, that is something you have to go after. But most everything else is probably trivial. And we need a very clear way of distinguishing what we're going to, to actually be fighting, because otherwise it's a lost battle. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to it. I'll go to Anya's point that the, there are a few places people trust. The loss of local news, I think, is a huge problem. Um, there's evidence more and more that people's identities, their political identities, are much more determined at the national level rather than the state or the local level. So they're tuned into national news, and those are the leaders they're increasingly placing all their trust in. And so um, and so it makes it hard sometimes to get through at a local level if, if we've eroded that ecosystem of information and also the le local levers of trust. Um, I also want to add to Dolores's point that like teaching people how they're being manipulated by the purveyors of misinformation seems to be a strategy that works. I do this in my intro psych class to 350 people every year and there's a game researchers have found it's very effective it's called the bad news game. And people play a game where they have to like spread misinformation and generate moral outrage to get followers. And so they learn how to manipulate people to win the game, but then it helps them understand how they might be being manipulated. And so I, I would love for more development of things like that that are interactive and people can start to understand and be, become skeptical and, and uh, more nuanced in their thinking. Um, I, and I, I like it because there's one of this, uh, this research on interventions for, for teenagers to stop them from smoking so much. One of the studies I always liked on that was, um, they found that worked was just basically communicating to teenagers that not that their the parents or authorities want them to stop, but that they're being manipulated by like tobacco executives. And that's actually the thing, one of the things that like really makes them seem not cool anymore to smoke. Um, and so like by helping them understand how these things are working and how they're being manipulated by these types of uh, the main small number of purveyors of misinformation. Um, so you can think of like the canonical case is probably Alex Jones. He's making, he made what, 50, 100 million dollars by sh selling, shilling like um, false cures for things on his website 
that he was attracting people to, for, to from spreading conspiracy theories, he realized like he's lining his pockets by spreading conspiracy theories. That's something that like, I think people find more objectionable that instead of being a truth teller, he's a grifter. And so I think like that's the dynamic that I think th there's probably some benefit in like educating people about that ecosystem and who the players are and, and ensuring that they're kind of trained to be robust to that because it, rather than debunking as Dollar said, we can't debunk every little piece of misinformation. It might be more useful to develop a general mindset of how people can be skeptical and search for accurate understandings of the world. Yeah. Summer, so if I can, Tiffany, go ahead. If I can actually jump in um, off of Jay's point, you know, I did a story recently on media literacy, and I talked to an 18 year old in Massachusetts who I think is a prime example of this in, in many ways. I mean, she's very, very smart. She's very politically um, engaged, and, and most importantly, I think she's she's very self aware. So she conducted um, a survey of of her school district where she talked to. Uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers about, you know, their media consumption habits, their media literacy capabilities. And what she found was that some huge number of students had never been taught that um, media outlets get their money through advertising, right? That, that there is a profit motive for um, many sources of information that they rely on. And, you know, as an extension of that, a lot of these kids had never realized that there might be a reason for them to um, want to look at the information provided to them with a skeptical eye. Now, this um, this person also um, looked at herself and realized, you know, she was getting a lot of her own education from Instagram, right? These are single sentence posts. A lot of them are infographics. And she stopped and thought, okay, well, I've never been taught that there, there are other avenues that I should explore to get a broader view. Um, of, of, of information, of, of current events. And so I think that, that this person's um, kind of evolution says a lot about what this country needs in terms of media literacy and information literacy and news literacy, um, generally speaking. Um, Sam Weinberg at Stanford does a lot of good research on this where he's um, looked at a lot of students and, and what, they're being, what they're being taught. And you know his conclusions are that one, we're not equipped at the moment to really educate students in a consistent and lasting way to, to look at information in, um, in a critical way, but he thinks that interventions work, that if we focus more on education, if we offer more, more lessons, that it, there will be an effect. Yeah, and I want to uh, shout out our uh, colleague Michelle Lipkin in the chat here. I see who's the head of the National Association of Media Literacy Educators, partner of PEN America, um, doing amazing work. And um, you know, I, my thinking is really you know, the way that humans consume information has completely changed in a revolutionary way over the last 20 years. And we have not adjusted our education system to reflect that and to help people think about how they consume and, and how they make assessments of of credible information. Um, we have an interesting question also about um, questions around visual misinformation and debunking. Um, and sort of the fact that, you know, we know people kind of understand information often better if it's visual, if it's also visual. Um, are there, do you think there are lessons based, uh, best practices that involve the visual presentation of information as part of the debunking method, um, especially given that lots of people are consuming these things online in the form of, you know, memes or things that get shared in chat groups or, or on social media. Um, I guess, Jay or Dolores, do you have thoughts on that first? Yes, I think in any efforts uh, by uh, the media to really convey the information in a way that's going to impact the population. I mean, those are, are absolutely key. This is visual, but also why not have shorter versions of an article that's, you know, pages and pages in, in ways that can be fully consumed by different levels of SES. We have, you know, an enormous population that can really not read beyond maybe an eighth uh, grade level. So, how we communicate and, and digesting that and making it uh, easy to process is, is going to be key. And, and of course, also different languages. And I know there are efforts to have translations or, or, or at least uh, the availability of the information in multiple languages so that we don't have, um, for instance, uh, Spanish speaking uh, populations only um, driven to one specific type of outlet. 
Absolutely. Anybody else on that one? Uh, Joan Donovan's group at Harvard did kind of an interesting um, report into misinformation, disinformation surrounding the invasion of Ukraine. And she looked, um, her team looked in part at uh, kind of the visual elements of, of those disinformation campaigns. What she noted was that, especially on places like TikTok, which is primarily visual, um, people have difficulty often discerning what's satirical um, as opposed to what's being um, said with a straight face. Um, it's really hard to moderate um, visual posts. Um, and so there, there is a push for you know, more AI, more human moderators to specifically focus on, on visual elements um, of communication to try to um, capture uh, more cases of misinformation and either flag it or take it down. Mm -hmm. And to do so more accurately, because I think you're absolutely right, we see so many cases where satirical content might be taken down by accident for sort of lack of the nuance of the algorithms understanding what's really happening. Um, I would note also, um, yeah. you know, we're talking about news media and then to a certain degree social media, but there's also been research that shows, you know, um, for example, WhatsApp can be a really significant kind of source of misinformation, again, from this perspective of people share with friends and family and peers. Um, and that's obviously uh, uh, an area that is not monitored in the way that news media and social media is. Um, another area that is sort of like just beginning to be studied is kind of audio misinformation. And so in either sort of live um, programs like Clubhouse, um, and then also just sort of the way that we engage with audio compared to the written world, word, compared to memes, I think parsing out kind of all the different ways that we consume media and information and perhaps don't even think of ourselves as doing so, right? Like if I sit down to read a book um, or if I pull up an article, that's a very different kind of process than scrolling through my phone or like chatting with my friends. And so if we, I think as we think about solutions to these kinds of things, thinking about the ways that we consume media throughout the day um, and put on kind of like different hats when we are consuming these different types of media, I think is really important. And also we are really just beginning to do that kind of nuanced work. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one. We have a new piece of data. One of the questions also, like we keep talking about social media, one of the questions in the chat was about social media algorithms. So, you know, 4 billion people are on social media now. There's all these platforms, WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Inst Instagram, we mentioned, um, LinkedIn too. And so um, we, we just did a study with a nationally representative sample of Americans about what they think algorithms are amplifying on some of these platforms. And they overwhelmingly think misinformation is one of the things being amplified um, because it attracts attention and it generates engagement. Um, but, and then there's a question about, of course, what the effects of that are, but that's the perception of people. And then there's a very strong commitment that they don't like that. And this is something that's almost totally bipartisan is that Republicans and Democrats both think that that type of stuff's being amplified and they also don't like that. And so um, that's actually one thing where there's actually like an interesting, probably hidden, reasonably bipartisan consensus or perception about what's going on and a consensus about that it needs to change. Of course, it's hard to figure out how to change it without regulation, but um, I think that that's the other thing is like figuring out ways to surface where there is consensus about things that people don't like, because that becomes often that's one of the roles of journalists, right, is like do investigative journalism and polls and stuff to, to surface the types of concerns that are widespread and shared to put pressure on organizations to figure out ways to solve that. Um, so I think that that's one of the things um, that that's important for us to think about too, is like, what are, what are those the conversations we need to have to, instead of just responding, reacting to each piece of misinformation, to think about like, what is the cultural, societal, democratic, pluralistic conversation we should be having about what people actually are opposed to at a consensus level and what are the things that could happen to change that? Absolutely, thank you. Um, and I know we really, you know, we want today to be practical for folks. I hope it's feeling that way, but I'd like to give each of our panelists a chance to um, just share some of the most important things you think journalists need to keep in mind as they're reporting in this environment, um, particularly in relation to the elections, um, but also specifically, um, especially maybe for Dolores and Jay, as we think about the psychology of disinformation, addressing a little bit of how journalists can, can be aware of and careful about falling into cognitive traps uh, or, you know, be essentially giving into some of the tripwires and biases that to which we're all vulnerable as, as they go about their reporting. Um, Dolores, maybe you can go to you first. 
Yes, I, I would say be aware of uh, reporting information that looks very fluent, uh, too well rounded to be really uh, legit, and, and also information that's um, emotionally you know, powerful, whether it's uh, in the sense of making you very happy or very angry, are probably uh, types of information that, that could be false. I would say uh, build reports so that if people can read half of your uh, article, they, they still get the gist and, and, and be aware that you must be communicating to very different audiences and literacy levels. Otherwise, we leave a vacuum and, and that vacuum might be uh, then captured by the types of uh, legacy media or other uh, actors that would actually inject misinformation um and and again uh doing more to make the uh, the audience critical and and sharing you know how difficult it is to reach conclusions and and to be critical and and go through your sources and and evidence rather than kind of hide that under the rug and and convey the the polished piece great thank you so much um anya Yeah, one thing that I'm thinking about, um, and we haven't really, you know, we're talking about news consumers um, and voters, but one thing we haven't really touched on is kind of the relationship between misinformation and violence. Um, and we are seeing um, sort of a level of threat against election workers, poll workers, um, civil servants, that is unprecedented. And so something I'm thinking about as a reporter is recognizing that my sources are at a level of risk um, in speaking to me, um, that has not necessarily been true in the past. And so how to be reporting on these types of things like threats against poll workers, for example, um, in a way that also, that is responsible to my readers in informing them, but that is also responsible to my sources um, in, in making sure that they understand the risk and that I understand the risk. Um, and that is, I think something, yeah, that hasn't necessarily had to, you know, cross a reporter's mind when covering things like democracy in America. Yes, unfortunately, I think that's very true. And we're obviously seeing that in, in a lot of areas as well. Um, Tiffany, advice you would share? Um, I would just, especially in an election season, just ask a lot of questions and, and be sensitive um, with the people that you're talking to, but don't be afraid to push for thorough explanations on uncomfortable topics, because that's always better than just assuming or guessing. Um, I would consult authoritative sources often and know what makes them authoritative. Um, I would check your work and then check it again. Um, be wary of moving too fast and trying to beat the crowd, uh, because surveys suggest that that's actually a sizable motivator for people who end up spreading misinformation in the first place. Jay. Um, so I would say like one of the things that I think journalists can do is communicate norms more effectively. So I'll give you an example of how it was done terribly during the pandemic. There, what, what, there'd be headlines like 50,000 members of the military refused to get vaccinated. But you read deep down the story and it's like 97% of them are vaccinated. And so the headline conveys the norm that a lot of people don't want to get vaccinated when the reality is the overwhelming majority of them already support it or do. And a lot of stories are framed like that, especially in the headline. And so you and I think this happens a lot around misinformation. It's easy to have like it's exciting and there's a lot of clickbait in a headline about like QAnon, you know, Trump has QAnon rally or something like that. It's, it's a concern. It should be. But we also need to convey that, you know, 92% of Americans actually don't agree with this or believe in it. And so I think we need to do a better job because there's tons of research that suggests people look to norms about how, what to believe and how to behave. And so if you're signaling like a classic study on this found that like there's a petrified forest, in, in, I think it was in California, and there was a sign that said, don't steal wood from the petrified forest, everybody's doing it and it's going to ruin the petrified forest. When there's a study that was done, it turns out that that actually led people to steal more wood because they hear that everybody else is doing it. And so a more effective way is like most people don't take wood from the petrified forest. It turns <laughs> out to be the message that like reduces their likelihood of doing it. And so you have a really powerful way to shape norms and beliefs about what the consensus is around these beliefs and the spread of these things um, and, and more healthy behaviors. And so that's something I think that gets abdicated an enormous amount because the headline about the exceptional case, the edge case is way more interesting and, and unfortunately it creates false perceptions. And I think that that is something we have, I haven't really heard that grappled with. 
uh, in, in the way we convey information. And just from a social psychological perspective, it's kind of like the worst possible practice. Right. One of the things we've talked about in some of our guidance is, is sort of report the denominator as well, right? You know, if you're talking about the handful of cases where, you know, there was something unusual happened at a polling place or something like that, talk about how many polling places that is actually out of, right? It makes a big difference. It's out of uh, five or 5,000 or 50,000. Um, and sometimes that piece does, does get missed. Um, I had a question in the chat about, or in the Q&A about um, differentiation between news and commentary. And I, I think this comes up a lot in terms of sort of how people have, have kind of lost a sense of the distinction between that, especially with a lot of cable news shifting over to such an emphasis on commentary. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, if anybody would like to just say a, a response, some thoughts on that question. What's the question again? Um, question is sort of what role is it? Um, what role is the kind of increased role of, of, of opinion and commentary, particularly in some forms of news and cable news, for example, um, playing in this is it making it harder for people to differentiate between what they're supposed to take as factual reporting and what they're supposed to take as, as opinion or commentary? Yes, if, if some um, regulatory innovation could be done to avoid calling news what's commentary, I mean, that would be great progress, but probably what could be done would be for uh, media outlets to get together and, and um, publicize bias indices and, and whether collectively the media that are involved in generating and, and tracking accuracy or tracking what's truly news, whether that, that could be um, published regularly and tracked in, in a way that at least uh, tries to counter that uh, confusion between commentary and news and, and you know the dissemination of uh, false information throughout. Um, I think there's been a tendency uh, among journalists to say, oh, this piece of information is coming from the right wing, ergo, it must be misinformation. I think that's that's a trap that it can be tricky to avoid for a lot of people, but it is one that you absolutely must avoid because there is plenty of opinion um, on both sides of the aisle that is um, very thought provoking. It's well researched. It's backed up, and you can't just assume that because it's coming from one side or the other that it's false. Um, that said, I, I think political propaganda, especially in recent elections, has been hard to parse through because there is more misinformation mixed into it. Um, and so, I think the the challenge for a lot of reporters has been to be able to look at a piece of information and determine, okay, is this fair as an opinion? And is it an opinion that is backed up um, as opposed to, is it just in an outlandish lie that's unfounded? I think one of our, our um, pre-session conversations was also a little bit about um, the reporting on people who believe disinformation. And somebody in the chat earlier on talked about the issue of empathy and how we kind of bring empathy to talking about people who are being targeted by disinformation and, and who are being brought into these sort of conspiracy theories. I'm wondering if, if somebody would like to say something about that issue and how reporters can think about that as well. Yeah, I think, oh, I'm go sorry, on, go ahead, Jay. Go on. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I think it's important to recognize, again, as both reporters ourselves and sort of news consumers, um, that we are all susceptible to misinformation. We are all susceptible to conspiratorial thinking. Um, it's a very human impulse to want sort of clean narratives to explain what goes on in our world. In fact, that is literally Tiffany's and my job is to present narratives that explain what is going on in our world. Um, and so to, to start from the perspective of there are, there are the purveyors and you know consumers of misinformation and then the rest of us is absolutely, I think, not the lens to start from. If we start from the perspective of every single one of us um, is susceptible to this and kind of starting from what is it about um, this climate change narrative or this health narrative um, that people are kind of attracted to, I think that's really a way to make sure that, again, that our journalism resonates with people, that it isn't kind of this perspective of, um, wagging our fingers or looking down our noses and that um, that this is something that's actually like a lot more kind of human and common. We have now this word for it, um, but it is not a new phenomenon and it's not sort of an atypical or a, a silly impulse. Um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to, to that. I realize we're probably out of time, but I, I saw someone tagged in the thing earlier. I was attacked by, I did a fact check for the AP on and Reuters on some misinformation. And then I was like bombarded by people online who were conspiracy theorists around COVID. And I got like a thousand messages on every single platform trying to get me fired and stuff because I fact checked this thing. Um, and so there are a group of people who, and this come up in a lot of questions, who are like active creators and spreaders of, di of uh, disinformation. And there are a small number of people and they do a lot of damage. The main person going after me was like a white supremacist who had 1.5 million followers. Jack Posebic is his name. Um, and then there, below them, there are a lot of people just spreading misinformation and they might be doing it unintentionally. They might falsely believe it because they've been in a, having a diet of misinformation for so long. Um, and so those are people who are probably susceptible. They probably need to be addressed differently from the people who are like, you know, Russia spreading disinformation at like propaganda or Jack Posebic or people like that who are like monetizing it or Alex Jones um, and generating a lot of it. And then there's like this huge audience and this includes, you know, like, like Ani was saying, all of us to some extent that we're susceptible. And so I think that's the target audience, the people that are like amplifying it or spreading it, probably not the people who are creating it. That's a very different group. And they don't respond to things like fact check. This was the reason I got targeted was in reaction to a fact check. It was a backlash or a backfire to fact check. That's why a lot of journalists and scientists get targeted for harassment campaigns is to shut us up. And so that's a very different psychology, a very different group. They generate most misinformation. They're really dangerous. They're often profiting from it. Um, and then there's a whole other group of, of people that are kind of more just need help getting in good information and have been misled. So I think we have to treat those in, in my view as psychologically different categories of people with different problems and different solutions. That's right. Thank you so much. And I want to say thanks to everybody. I know we're at time and I'll hand it back over to Julie, but this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you all. Thank you uh, so much, Summer. Thank you to our panel. You guys packed so much information into this hour. Um, I learned so much from you and I know the participants did too. And thank you to the participants who shared great questions and great comments. We will provide a link to the video this afternoon and we'll provide uh, links to the many resources that were shared as well. So you can keep mining this conversation for guidance. Thank you all again so much for being here. Uh, stay well, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much.